This is the Western Obsessions TV podcast, where hunting's not a hobby, it's an obsession. All right, guys, welcome back to the Western Obsessions TV podcast. And on this podcast, I've got a very cool guest, man. I'm super excited about it. I've been watching these guys for a few years now on YouTube. And uh, very cool guys, man. They're doing some big stuff in the industry. Today, I have got Aaron War Britain on the podcast with The Hunting Public. Aaron, did I butcher your last name, man? No, you nailed it. Which All right. you know, a lot of people do butcher it. I they I had teachers in middle school call me Warbertron. They did. <laughs> they, so I've, I've I've heard it a bunch of different ways. But that was good. All right, good. Warbertron. That sounds like a uh, a transformer name or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, Aaron, man, again, thank you so much for being on the podcast this morning, man. I know we're busy. We're talking about some house stuff you got to get done before you got to head out of here on some hunts. You guys always have a ton of hunts, a lot of cool videos. So thanks a lot again, man, for being on the podcast. No problem. Happy to do it. Yeah. So, you know, I watch a ton of you guys' videos. I've been watching for years. And actually, like the first video that I saw of you guys on YouTube was you guys were spot and stalking whitetail. And I was like, no way, man. Like, you know, spot and stock whitetail, that is a hard feat to do. And But you guys were pulling it off, man. So it gave me a little bit of confidence to get out of my tree stand and do something different with whitetail. So I'm about to say that, that was like my first experience with you guys. Yeah, we kind of jump out of the box a little bit sometimes. You know, it doesn't work all the time for sure. We screw up way more than we succeed. But um, yeah, it's been fun so far. But that's hunting, right? Like we screw yep. up way more than we succeed. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially deer hunting, man. Whitetails are tricky critters to kill with a bow. They are, hundred percent. So I know you guys got a, a team of people, and I'm a I'm a little bit confused. I know like some of your main guys, like you and Ted and Jake and Zach, but you got more people involved. Who's your Who's your core guys, and who's Who's like all involved in in what you guys do? Well, me, Greg, and Zach own uh the hunting public okay. and then ted and ted and jake work for us as employees and then greg's wife mindy also works for us she's more behind the scenes and then hayden Krimmer is our brand manager he's also behind the scenes i mean you'll see both of them you know appear on videos and stuff every now and then uh but for the most part that's that's our crew you know, the guy, the guys that are doing content mostly are me, Greg, Zach, uh, Jake and Ted. And then we get we bring in new interns every year. This year, we've got a couple of them, Nick Andrews from Texas and then Keith Robinson from Ohio. Keith will actually be getting here in the next day or two. So that's pretty much it. We just okay. run around as a big group of buddies filming hunts and editing videos to put on YouTube. What a life, man. That sounds, you know, on the outside looking in, it seems, man, if I could do that, if I could have that life, those guys are living the dream, but I, I'm assuming it's probably not all sparkles and rainbows and fairy tales. Am I right? Yeah. I mean, we go, we hunt some pretty challenging places, uh, where, you know, at times we go days, even weeks without hardly even seeing a deer. And we run into all sorts of, of hurdles that we've got to deal with as far as that's concerned. But that doesn't really bother us that much. It's more the the work aspect that people don't see is that the videos take a long time to produce. So every day when we come in, we are capturing footage, logging footage, organizing footage. And that can take anywhere from one to three hours just at the end of a day. And when you're sleeping in a tent eating, you know, pb and j and freaking granola bars for weeks and weeks on end that um eventually you start it starts wearing on you to where it's you know it's it's a bit of a grind but we've got a great crew and we kind of split up the workload between us so that you know each guy has some time to rest and stuff as we're going throughout the season we don't just we used to just go like 60 days you know straight through where we would hunt like a week or so and then we would edit for four or five days and we would go back and hunt and never take any breaks but anymore we we usually go on a hunt for seven to ten days and then we'll we'll come back and we'll edit and we'll produce some content 
do some work from home and then we'll go back out, you know, three weeks to a month later because it's a long deer season. So mm -hmm. we've sort of started to pace ourselves a little bit, but the editing and the, in the capturing footage and dealing with footage is what people don't see. And it takes an enormous amount of time. I mean, it, you're talking, I'll kind of go back to that for a second. You're talking one to three hours to capture one day's worth of footage. And then it's going to take somebody at least 10 hours to edit it and export it. And then depending on your internet connection, it could take 30 minutes. It could take 12, 16 hours to upload it to the internet. Mm -hmm. So you're talking a full day's work, um, 20, you know, 24 hours possibly for one video for one person to do. And obviously we split that up, but a lot of people don't see the sitting, you know, at camp at midnight, 1 a.m. editing the editing video so that we can get them posted the following morning or the following afternoon and still be able to go out and hunt. But yeah. that's kind of the thing. We would all sleep better if we just would not, if we would try not to hunt as much, but it's like, man, we got to get back out there. So we're just pounding coffee and trying to get it done as quickly <laughs> as we can sleeping an hour and a half, two hours and then going back out. Yeah. Dang. And you're right. Like a lot of people don't understand the workload that has to do with filming a hunt. Like filming a hunt in general is just very challenging and very tough, but then like taking all that footage and doing something with that footage is an, a monster job. And you guys produce so much content. Like you guys do a great job of producing content and been producing it for years. I'm only a couple of years in and I'm trying to produce content, man. It is, it is a enormous job. Like that workload alone. And then let's add in and figure in the time away from home, away from your family. People don't understand that that can add up a lot too. How do you guys deal with that? I mean, I pretty much don't see my family in fall and the spring. Uh, and then I see them, you know, 40% of the time, 50% of the time in the summer. So, yeah, we don't see them very often greg and mindy are actually moving to rapid city south dakota next week so that they can be closer to family yeah. because they've she's lived like 11 or 12 hours from her family in north dakota for the last 12 years so yeah. they're moving out there luckily for me you know we're based out of southern iowa and the majority of my family and relatives and stuff are in northeast missouri so they're they're only like a couple hours away that's nice man yeah and Iowa's got some great hunting. So does Missouri. So you're, you're yep, in a good absolutely. part of the Midwest. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So how did all this get started? Like, uh, you know, tell me about that process. I'm sure you guys haunted since you're a kid and we can get into how you started hunting, but like, how did the company get started? Uh, it's, I mean, kind of at the kitchen table sitting around eating dinner. Um, honestly, it didn't, it wasn't really this big grand plan or anything like that. Uh, we we worked for Bill Winky at Midwest Whitetail for a long time. Uh, Greg started working there in 2010, and I started working there in 2011. And then we hired Zach as an intern and eventually as a full-time employee in 2015 at Midwest Whitetail. And all of us had grown up hunting public land or small properties on permission. And the one thing that we noticed a huge challenge for us when we moved to Iowa in like 2010 and 11 was that it was very difficult to get permission to hunt. Um, a lot of ground, you know, Iowa is, is sort of your, one of your trophy buck states, if you will. So a lot of the ground is really expensive. It is leased up. It's owned by outfitters or it's owned by, you know, individuals or groups of guys that are managing specifically for trophy bucks. So access is difficult. So we, I mean, we found ourselves transitioning more and more to public land when we got there, just out of necessity uh, more than anything. And we were producing content as we went because that's what we did at Midwest Whitetail was we, we produced web content for the internet. And that's really how all of us learned to, I would say, you, you, brought, you mentioned the, the volume of content that we put out. That's where all of us learn to produce content at a very efficient level, very quickly. Because at Midwest Whitetail, Bill would let us hunt as much as we wanted as long as we got our video projects done. And, you know, for me, that might mean three to five videos edited and produced every week. For Greg, that might mean, you know, a couple of higher end videos produced every week. So if we edited all night long, then we could hunt during the day. Um, he was, he was cool with us doing that. Like I had a key to the office. I could go in and work 
I could work 20 hours straight or I could go in and work two hours and leave. As long as I got my stuff done by my deadlines, um, we could spend time in the woods. So that sort of motivated us to figure out how to edit very quickly, but also still produce a quality video. Mm -hmm. And we did that in, in sort of that seven years that I spent there. That was that was training us. I mean, I'm talking thousands of videos produced anywhere from five minutes to 30 minutes long hunting videos that that helped us become super, super efficient. So I had to preface the whole story by talking about that, because yeah. I feel like without that time there and learning how to do this really fast, we would have struggled more getting into YouTube. But when I left there in 2017, I was going to go back to work for my old boss, Marvin, and fixing appliances. I was I was considering doing that and also dabbling in uh, hunting videos in some capacity, like doing some editing projects just on the side for folks, because I built somewhat of a network. And at that time, I was still doing some work for Bill at Midwest Whitetail. So... I was doing a little bit of that and I had plans to go back to maybe being a service tech on appliances because I enjoyed doing that job in college. And then we got together one night at Greg's. We were just, and we would go over there all the time over the years and eat dinner over there. Um, and we were just kind of sitting around the table and we were like, man, you know what? People seem to like our public land videos and they seem to relate to them. It's it's kind of like the general public that hunts wants to see this type of content. They, they're they gaining some sort of value out of this. And we're like the general public that hunts, that's the hunting public, right? That's those. And we're like, that's got a nice ring to it. Maybe we should, maybe we should start a YouTube channel and start posting stuff on there. And we're broke. I mean, we had a couple thousand bucks between us that we used to buy a camera or two, I think, in an editing computer, like a laptop. I mean, it wasn't a very big investment. I'm thinking 10 or 12 grand total. That's all we had in savings between me and Greg. And we just said, all right, well, we'll buy some stuff and then do odd jobs and sort of try to make it work. And we didn't make any money at it at all for a year, probably. Um, it was just a money pit. You know, we were just putting money into it and – it was growing and we were having a blast doing it. You know, that's one common thing about our group is like, we don't really care about money. We just, as long as we can get by on paying our bills uh, and be able to run around and hunt and then help teach people and create value for folks out there, then that's rewarding enough in itself. So we were, mm -hmm. we were able to start it and eventually it, it got legs under it and it started to take off. It took it about it took it about six months to a year, but then all of a sudden we started getting all these people coming on there and watching, and it started to make a little bit of income for us. And that income you talk about, are you talking about the ad revenue through YouTube? Yep, ad revenue through YouTube. Eventually, um, a few sponsors, uh, merchandise. What else we did? We do some custom work. And especially during that time, we were doing a lot more custom like editing, photography, video work for even other businesses outside of the hunting industry. That was yeah. just to pay the bills yeah. because it, you know, gas money and tags and all that and food and camera equipment, all that stuff. I mean, video storage costs money. So we weren't making any at that time. So we had to work behind the scenes doing other things just to pay the bills but yeah we we make our living now just out of a bunch of different buckets of revenue none of them are particularly big individually but youtube ad revenue definitely helped mm -hmm. yeah and i know like just the cost alone to go on one hunt not even just driving to where you need to, to hunt not even paying for hotel room None of that stuff. Like I typically spend probably a thousand dollars a hunt just on gas money oh, and yeah. food and the tag and the gear. And yeah, man, it's, it's definitely not, not a cheap oh, yeah. I mean, thing to do. With gas the way it is right now, I'd say we probably lost money last spring, um, turkey hunting. And the reason why we turkey hunts, cause we just absolutely love hunting turkeys. But mm -hmm. to be honest, it's not nearly as popular as any sort of big game hunt that you would go on elk, mule, deer, antelope, deer, whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's just turkey hunts not as popular, so not near as many people watch it. 
but we go every year because we absolutely love turkeys and yeah, yeah a lot of people a, a lot of people look at it and, and think oh you know they've got almost half a million subscribers they got to be making a bunch of money but that's not necessarily the case um all, you know all year long especially with turkeys because yeah. it's a smaller audience yeah but you guys you know I, i'm it's a trade-off right like you get to live the life that you want to live even though you're mm-hmm. not getting rich at doing it but you get to live how you want to live right yeah yeah so that's i know right. you, you guys, are, you're, you're saying about creating content for other brands. Are you referring to the uh, the Woods Guys uh, yep. company? Yeah. Yep. So I saw you guys, have the Woods Guys Incorporated, and that's kind of your content creation digital media company, correct? Yeah, that's what we started everything at, out as, is the Woods Guys. And yeah. that's just, I mean, that's just like a Zachism, if you will. He just came up with that back when we hunted at Midwest <laughs> White. I was like, he would always just be like, are you guys ready to go out and be woods guys today? And it's like, yeah, I guess so. I mean, we pretty much live out there. So yeah, that's just, <laughs> so we just called it that. It's like, it's unique. It's pretty ridiculous and stupid. So we might as well call it something like that. I and, like it, uh, man. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah, it's a good name. yeah. Thanks. Do you guys still create that's, content for other brands? Uh, Yeah. Some, not near as much as we, as we did before. Honestly, most of the most of the other content we make now is through partners within the industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, we even work with we've worked with some state agencies over the years, not directly through them, but um, on like hunter education content. And that's one thing we've even done that with uh, Randy Newberg and his crew out west. We've done some stuff with them where uh, we're just basically creating hunter ed content like how to safely use a turkey decoy or how to sight in your bow just very basic basic things for youth and new hunters to watch and learn from and even in some states as you know most of them now have apping products on their phones Mm -hmm. or on or on your phone where you can carry your license and check in your game or whatever but a lot of that is new to people and they need to be educated on how to correctly use those software and stuff like that. And we've done videos like that for various companies showing people how to do, how to use it properly so that they legally can tag their deer or whatever it is. And, and yeah. also access it to read regulations and whatnot. Yeah. Well, and I noticed that on your guys' website and I, I hadn't noticed this before, before I was kind of digging around a little bit last night, uh, the hunting class, yeah. you guys have a hunting class or a hunting online course. Uh, also, yep. is that a good revenue uh, stream for you guys? Uh, not yet. It may become one at some point. Um, it's called Deer School, and we more or less just created it out of, well, because of YouTube tightening their restrictions all the time on hunting. It, it's they YouTube still wants to have hunting content on their platform, but they do censor you from doing certain things. Like we have a lot of good educational content showing different blood trails and stuff like that from different hits on animals. But we have to be very careful about showing that on YouTube, Mm. you know, because the content will either get demonetized, which isn't the end of the world to us. But if it's, if it flags too many of, of their uh, rules and the algorithm, they could pull the video down and they could suspend your channel. Right. which is very unfortunate and inconvenient for us, but that's just the world we live in. It's a global communication platform. I mean, we have zero control over it. Uh, we just have to, you know, that's like I said, that's the world we live in. So we, we continue to put content on YouTube, but the, that's the main reason we did the deer school stuff is so that we could have content that we control on our own uh, website where we can show that stuff. That was the main thing. It's like we wanted to be able to show educational videos on how to quarter a deer or how to process a deer or, you know, how to identify different types of blood trails or what to do with different hits on animals and all of that. We wanted to have that content live somewhere. So we decided just to make a full course for it where everything is, there's nothing censored about it. Yeah. Um, just because it lives on our own platform. Yeah, I think that's great. 
And I see a lot of guys or I've not a lot, a few hunting companies are now going to like a subscription base. Oh yeah. If you would like my content, subscribe and you can have all my content. I'm sure that's yeah. really good to protect you guys as a business in case your YouTube channel does get, you know, taken down by YouTube or not. What do you guys feel about the subscription base model? Um, we like it. This, the deer school course is more of like an educational course where we, where we take deep dives into the specifics of some of these hunts. Or we talk about the specifics of certain tactics that we use. I would say it's it's a little bit slower content. Like it's the YouTube stuff is more fast paced. It holds your attention. It's the actual hunts. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely more popular. But the deer school stuff is more informative. Yeah. And the subscription model you're referring to would be if we took all of our content and put it underneath that umbrella where people could you know, pay a monthly fee to watch it all. And mm -hmm. we're, we're considering doing that, but I still do like YouTube a lot. And I, I feel like as long as social media, cause that's what I consider YouTube to be yeah. social media, it, as long as it is, it's the forefront of communication for better or worse. I feel like honey needs to have a presence there. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why we're not pulling out of Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or anything like that. We're still, we're still putting our best foot forward there and just trying to live within the rules that they create, whether we like them or not. I mean, I, I will fight them all as long as I can <laughs> on some of this stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's what especially young people use to communicate now. Mm -hmm. And if we want to talk to them, if we want to, you know, educate them on hunting and get them in and, uh, you know, eventually recruit them into our ranks, I feel like we need to be participating in that communication in some way, shape or form. If we go to a subscription based only model, then we sort of cut that cord from them. Yep. Um, you can still recruit some of them in there, but you're more so just dealing with people that are already hunters that are sort of your hardcore followers yeah yeah man i i really i enjoy what you're saying i like what you're saying right now um i i agree with you on the subscription base thing is you're definitely cutting out and you're not able to help as many people and as, as you guys are listening or watching this podcast i think you're getting the vibe from aaron is they're all about helping their fans helping people that are watching them with education and anything they can do they're not all about money and and they're there because they love it uh, one one thing I wanted to ask you here, Aaron, talking about that is obviously uh, you're helping to get a lot of new hunters in the field. And I've recently started something called a hunt mentor where I'm trying to do the same thing. I don't have the reach that you guys got, but I'm trying to do. And I've got some backlash on it from other hunters saying, hey, we don't need any more hunters in the field. All right. We got plenty of hunters in the field. Stop getting more hunters in the field. Do you guys get any of that? And if you do, oh, yeah. how, how do you deal with that? Oh yeah, we certainly do. And some people honestly have a point. Uh, it just depends on the, depends on the nature of the argument. There's, there's always going to be folks that consider their public land down the road is their property, you know, and they don't want to see anybody else out there. They want to be able to go down there, have a good experience and not run into anybody ever. And for those people, all I can say is that's, that's tunnel vision. That is not long-term thinking for hunting. Right. Uh, because what happens when you leave? If you don't, if, if that place isn't getting utilized by more people, especially young people, nobody's going to take your place in the ranks. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've seen over time up until the pandemic was that hunter recruitment, especially young hunters was dropping mm -hmm. across the board. Um, really, I mean, there's, there's certain situations where it wasn't, but for the most part, I mean, I looked at this data over and over again for many, many years, and it was just a constant downtrend in most states, uh, especially with the young hunters. But on the flip side of that, the pandemic has put a lot more people in the woods, especially, and it's given the people that already hunt two or three times the amount of time to hunt that they had prior to it. So mm -hmm. there's a balance here. Like, you've got to be able to manage the resource while also allowing people, giving people opportunity to hunt. So if you, if some people bring up the point, like we don't need any more hunters because they're killing all the animals on the, the land that I hunt. Like we have too many hunters. 
And in some situations, they might be right where we need to dial that back to some degree. But what I, the way that I always look at it is I'll, I'll use turkeys for an example, because that's been a hot topic uh, recently. If the state offers you three turkeys and you have to share those three turkeys now with a new hunter that might be a kid from right down the street, you know, that's going to high school. Say you can't kill all three of your birds on that public piece this year. You can only kill one. And that's basically to give that kid an opportunity to go and harvest one himself. I'll do that every day of the week. Mm -hmm. If that kid gets an opportunity to go, um, because I've killed a bunch of them and I've been fortunate to travel all over the country and do this. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're not going to starve. We can, we can give up that, that bird or two or that, that little bit of opportunity, but I do see the other side of that. You know, we can't, we can't flood the woods with people and kill all the, all the animals on it. That's that, yeah. that's not beneficial for us. That's not beneficial for the States because then the States can't sell, like they can't sell licenses. If all that, if there's no game to be chased on the land, like they have no, we basically have no conservation model. So you, you have to have both. You've got to have hunters buying licenses to fund conservation to protect the wildlife that are there and to create habitat for them. But you also have to have the wildlife. And that's the job of the states to manage that balance. But when it comes to getting kids involved, I take a little bit different approach. It's like, man, if you're, if you're talking about getting a new hunter involved and you got a couple of kids that are just chomping at the bit to get in the woods and they need to learn how to do this, you can sacrifice. If you've been doing this for a long period of time, you're an adult and experienced hunter. You can sacrifice some of your time and be unselfish for those, for those young people. That's the way I think it should go anyway. Some absolutely. people may disagree with me, but. No, absolutely, man. I think that's really well said when you're talking about conservation. Obviously, hunters help conserve public lands and the animals that, that live on them, but the states need to balance tag allocations. I think it's 100% right. And of course, our youth, man, because that is the future of conservation is getting a youth in there. And the barrier of entry to go hunting, if you didn't grow up with someone that hunted in your family, it would be your dad, uncle, mom, cousin, whatever the barrier of entry to start hunting, not even as a youth, but even as like an adult or a young adult is enormous is where do I go? How do I get a tag? Uh, what gear should I wear? Like, how do I shoot a gun or a bow? Like that barrier is huge. And I think mentors like you guys mentor thousands and thousands and thousands of people, guys like you guys like are crucial for our youth to build a future. Well, thanks, man. That's what, that's, Ideally, what we're trying to do, I mean, it's, I get frustrated too, man. If I, I'm trying to draw elk tags out West and they're getting <laughs> harder and harder to get. I want to go elk hunting. Yeah. I, I get it. Um, But at the, at the end of the day, that's when we're done with all this stuff years down the road, what are we going to have left? You know, are we going to have, are we going to have a big group of young people coming in behind us that are sort of carrying on that same tradition or will we just have squeezed all the juice out of that orange for ourselves? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I see both. I see all sides of it, though. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, so that's good, man. We're not you're not tunnel vision. Not you're, you're seeing every angle on it. And I think that's a mature adult, which we don't have a lot of those in our hunting industry. <laughs> it seems sometimes <laughs> uh, let me back up a little bit, man. We talked a lot about. Uh, you guys making a living doing what you do. Um, and there's, I mean, now that YouTube is so much bigger than what it was 10 years ago, um, a lot of hunting channels on YouTube. What is there any advice you could give someone on if they want to make a living doing something similar that you guys are doing? Um, it would, it would be exactly that. Don't do something similar, do something different. <laughs> um, because we got really, really lucky when we jumped into this thing. Timing was perfect and we did not do that on purpose. That was complete luck accident. We, but we were prepared. Our skills were prepared up to that point to make that leap. So like I mentioned that all that time in Midwest squad tell learning how to edit really fast. That, that was perfect for YouTube. Mm -hmm. And we just had to make a few adjustments to our production style. And then we were off and running. Um, but the, I guess the main mistake that I see folks make is they try to create a channel that is just like ours and they, 
or just, I mean, insert whoever there, whoever they follow along with, they might, they might try to do things just like Cameron Haynes or just like Jeff Sturgis or whoever. And the, the thing is, is you need to be unique, offer, offer the viewers value. And what we tried to do is put the, always put the viewers first. Like, what are they, what are they going to gain from watching this video? Are they going to gain knowledge about a piece of gear? Are they going to gain some sort of education about a mistake that we made on this particular hunt so where we, maybe we can help them avoid the same mistake? If, and that's how we make our decisions based on our content. If you're, if you're providing value for the viewer and you are unique and different, yet also relatable to them, you can really make strides very quickly on YouTube and social media. But where people get hung up is they do, they do things exactly the same as what the rest of the industry is doing. And they don't, and they try to almost copy others Mm -hmm. to do that. Now I'm not saying we watch, we watch other YouTube channels all the time for inspiration on content ideas and stuff. But that's one thing people I think like about us is that we're just regular dudes. We're just, I'm just an average redneck dude that likes to hunt. I don't know how else I can put it. I ain't real great at it. I'm not bad at it. I'm average and I make mistakes at it. Sometimes we, sometimes we do things right. And we just try to show people all of that and talk about every single thing that we've learned along the way. Um, it's very, we're honest, maybe do a fault sometimes, but that's, that's how we've done it up to this point. And then, and if you want to be successful at it, you've got to be unique. You need to, you need to have your own style. You need to, you know, show your own unique personality. Don't try to be somebody else or act like somebody else. And that will serve you well. And always keep the viewer top of mind when you're making videos. Don't make a video just for you. Make a video for them. Man, that's that's great advice, man. And just to recap that, guys, for you guys listening, is what Aaron just said is be unique, be true to yourself, and think about the viewers and the customer first, right? Yeah. That's it, man. That's that's great, dude. Um, we talked a little bit about um, public land hunting in the Midwest. I grew up in Nebraska, Whitetail okay. Hunting, southeast corner of Nebraska, so I'm very familiar with Iowa. and We'd slide over there every once in a while, but... Um, God, when I was young growing up, it, the, to be able to get permission to hunt on private land was very easy because we had a bunch of old farmers that hated deer and they're like, yes, get over here and get them out of my corn. And it was so nice. And then you fast forward 15 years later, even, you know, say let's 10, 12, 15 years ago, it has gotten very hard to get private access um, how else have you seen, that's one way I've seen the industry change a lot is now is there's a lot more money in the game as far as leasing land. Um, what else have you seen uh, going on in the industry over the last 20 years for you growing up? I've seen the exact same thing. I graduated high school in 2005 from Paris, Missouri with I think 36 other people, real small town. Um, and when I was a kid in high school and even in the late nineties, it was not hard to get permission. Mm-hmm. And honestly, there was just as many people hunting at that time as there is now, but they were spread across the landscape more evenly. It's like me and two or three of my buddies could hunt on the same farmer's ground. And it was, it wasn't public land. Not anybody could walk in there, but you know, you would have, you would have lots of other people hunting the same property. Like I'd call, I, at one time we own about a hundred acres. My grandpa bought it way back in the seventies. And, uh, um, my dad and his three brothers own it now. And at one time I can hunt on our hundred acres and about 700 acres surrounding it between four to five different neighbors. So I could just walk off my back porch in high school and I could walk for miles up and around and through that turkey hunt. It was awesome. But some of those neighbors, I had to call ahead and ask them if they were going to have anybody in there. And they would be like, no, I got you know, I got a buddy of mine that hunts on the weekends, but he won't be there since it's Tuesday and Wednesday. You can hunt during the middle of the week, you know, and then this other neighbor might be like, well, we also turkey hunt, but we're not going to be in there towards the end of the season. We're only going to hunt the first week. And my other neighbor, he hunts occasionally. You always check with him to make sure he's going to be in there or not so that you're safe. But, but that's, that was the case back then. 
is everybody hunted to some degree. Most people bought a license, but they weren't like, I don't, I wouldn't say super hardcore into it. And you mm-hmm. kind of shared that landscape with them. Yep. And fast forward, like you said, to f- even five to 10 years after that, I now we only have permission to hunt on two of our, our neighbors instead of five. And they're the ones that butt right up against our land and they are the still the same people that own them. So yeah. the same, we've had the same neighbors for 30 some years on two sides of our property. On the other sides, the land has been sold. It's been chunked up and it is much smaller parcels now. And it's everybody own their, the people own their individual properties and they don't allow anybody else to hunt. They're all real nice people. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't blame them for, you know, having that piece of property and hunting on, but that's, that's all, that's another reason why we started the hunting public is because we realized that wow we don't we can't get private permission much anymore it's getting very difficult and if it's getting difficult for us it's definitely getting difficult for a teenager that is looking for a place to hunt yep um so their only option is going to be to go on public land for l- at least some maybe they start on public land and then they They get older and they save some money and they can afford to buy a piece of property or lease a piece or whatever it is. But that's, that was my situation growing up. And as I got into the industry and started networking and meeting people across the board, I heard that same story you just told me of your, when you were growing up Yeah. over and over and over again. And I was like, wow, this isn't a problem that's just happening in Northeast Missouri. This is a problem in Iowa in Nebraska in Pennsylvania in Wisconsin in Florida in you know north carolina you go across the board and access is is much 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 harder to get yeah and it's gotten steadily harder over as time has went on so the only way we felt like we could combat that in a way is just to show people that they have public opportunities that can be good you need to change your you need to change your mindset a little bit and your expectations because it's most of the time not going to be as good of hunting and you're going to have to share the woods with a lot of other people and go about it a different way. But you still have the opportunity. And as long as we still have the opportunity there, then we need to be using it. Yeah. Which will lead right into my next question on talking about hunting public land. Um, and I've noticed nowadays there's more public land, or at least where I've gone hunting is there's more public land options than there used to be. So I think that the states have done a good job of allowing that. And there's now walk-in um, mm-hmm. access where hunt or the state will pay the landowner a certain amount of money to allow hunting on their land and you can walk in, which is super great. But how do you guys go about dealing with the hunting pressures and some of the uh, sketchy stuff that happens on public land, like stolen tree stands and cameras and <laughs> a lot of that stuff that happens? Uh, very patiently. That's <laughs> that's the best <laughs> way I can put it, because it definitely happens everywhere that we go. Um, we, we're constantly dealing with some amount of hunting pressure, but uh, it's rarely something that we can't uh cope with it's rarely I, I used to think when i was a kid i'd see one other hunter and i'd be like oh this whole area is burned and now i look at that and i think of how i can use that to my advantage in some way because that's what good. you'll what you'll find is any sort of wildlife that's being hunted whether it's deer turkeys whatever elk they're gonna avoid people mm-hmm. so if you see two or three parking lots full of hunters and you can anticipate where they're going, you can sort of check off a lot of sections of that map and narrow down where the deer are going to be. If you just go to that spot where there's no people, you find them. And right. It's really very, it's, it's that simple in a lot of situations. It's like you're paying more attention to the hunters and the hunter sign in that area than you are even the, the deer. And then that's how you, that's how you find them in a lot of cases. But even to your point about the walk-in areas, that's why a lot of those states are doing that is, you know, the state has to have people that's buying licenses. They've, they've got to have places for people to go. So they have to create access opportunities um, so that people, when they buy one, have a, have a place to go. And that I think in large part is due to the fact that, private access has shrunk so much. Um, and that's not just on the behalf of sort of the commercialization of hunting, if you will, 
that's also habitat loss. You know, as we as we continue to build these bigger city centers and these suburban areas, habitat gets destroyed every day for mm-hmm. these animals to live. And that is narrowing down the the places where they can be. But anyway, that's sorry, I kind of went down the no. rabbit hole there. But it, as like far it. as dealing with hunting pressure, that's that's what we do most of the time. We just kind of look for where it is and try to be where it ain't. Yeah. Which is, it seems really simple, a simple concept, but like, it's something I think a lot of people will uh, overlook. I know I'm the same way as like, oh, I would rather hunt all day and not see any animals rather than seeing a bunch of other people. <laughs> yeah, I just, my, I don't like seeing other people. If I'm out in the woods or on the mountain, I, I want to be in nature and see if I can be alone in nature and hopefully find some animals. Sure. That's my, right. But that's a great way to look at it is, Hey, you know, use those hunters or other people as advantage. And would it would be safe to say like the spot that there is no one there is because no one wants to go there. It might be harder territory. Yeah. A lot of times that's the case. Um, yeah. But even then we, we'll talk to people and figure out, you know, that that's one misconception that I even had growing up all the time. I would be, I would see somebody and I would be, I would do whatever I had to do just to get away from them and not talk to them or anything. But now we'll pull into a parking lot and we'll just start visiting with folks. And hopefully they'll let us know the area that they plan to hunt. Mm-hmm. And that's not so we can go in and poach their spot. It's so that we can avoid it and give them yeah. their space. Yeah. Um, because in most situations, if they let us know now, every, every person's not going to operate this way. You know, you're going to have some bad apples out there, but if we pull in somewhere and two of the guys that are, they got there ahead of us, tell us where they're going and tell us how long they plan on hunting there. Um, we'll avoid those areas. And then we are one less person that they have to worry about coming in on them and spoiling their hunt. And we also, we all, it also makes our hunting more efficient because we know where people are going to be. So yeah. we can focus on the areas where they aren't. Yeah. That's a, another great point, man. I, I've guided a lot of elk hunting. I own an outfitter or actually I just sold it this year, but got a lot of elk hunting in the, in the mountains here in Colorado. And I always cringe, always cringe and always hope that no one else would be in I guess public land, but I'm, these guys are paying me to take them out and put them on some good elk and, if there's other hunters in there, it just makes things a little bit difficult. But I always found that if I just went up and talked to them, made a game plan. Hey, where are you guys going? All right, we're going to be over here. I'll stay away from you. You stay from, away from us. And that way we're not messing each other's up, other hunts up. Most hunters are very receptive to that. Most hunters, just like me and you, that they don't want to be around other people either. And uh, it usually works out really good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Back to your what you're talking about as far as like shrinking of public access so I like that topic, man. I'd like to, to talk more about it. Um, you made a good point of uh, just land itself going away through cities getting bigger. Another thing that I, I had thought about, I heard from a buddy of mine, is the way that farmers are farming now are not leaving enough habitat for turkey, pheasant, deer. What's your thoughts on that, Aaron? Well, that's a, that's a long conversation, a very nuanced topic because it <laughs> is, there are so many interests involved with that. I, I have some of my best friends farm and they have pretty good size farming operations around where, around where I grew up. In fact, one of them, uh, I've, I've taken tons of youth hunters on my buddy's farm and he's a farmer and he explains this to me really well because he's a hunter. He wants to have a place to go. He wants to have a place to take his kids. And he's also a farmer. And really what's happened in the last 30 or 40 years is farming has went from a local type of a, of a job, if you will, from small farms to larger and larger enterprises. And we're having to feed the globe now because mm-hmm. our economies are globally linked. So we have to grow and this is the way that my buddy sam explains it to me he's like now compared to the 80s we have to grow more because more countries and you know people across the pond are dependent on our stuff just like our local people are dependent on it that's just the way that the the global economies have i mean most people are aware of this you know i mean they they know how this works and that has put more pressure on farmers to grow more crops, create more farmland. And I think that has all, and 
a sort of negative that has come from that, obviously, is fence rows get bulldozed in. You know, they plant, in some cases, they try to plant as close as they can up to a water source so that they can get a few more rows in here or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's what suffers is the wildlife in some cases. And it's fine. It's trying to find a balance between the two of them, you know, and that that's what my buddy, Sam, those guys do a really good job with their farm. They, they have large sections of it that they leave for wildlife or, and they don't, I mean, they don't do a lot of that as far as habitat destruction, but he also understands why a farmer would need to, because they need to, they have, you know, 400 acres that they own and land ain't getting cheaper. Yeah, they've got to maximize their yield on that because their family depends on that income yep. and people that are, you know, consuming this food has expanded to the point where they have to farm more to make, you know, that income each year. So that's a very, that's like I said, it's a, it's a difficult topic. I am all for wildlife habitat. Like I wish there was prairies, you know, with native habitat everywhere and, yeah. and, you know, woodlots and fence rows and all that things and quail. And I would rather see that personally, but that's my own personal beliefs. And when I talk to my buddies at farm, I see the other side of the coin. It's like, man, this is a very difficult, this is a difficult thing to handle. Yeah. And farming has got to be tough. Problem. Man. I'm not a farmer. I didn't grow up farmer. I grew up on a cow farm, but yeah. um, it's got to be a hard thing to do with droughts and just like you said, land's not getting any cheaper anytime soon ever. And it just, it would be hard to be a farmer and have to balance that and understand, man, I have to stretch a couple more rows to pay the bills and man, I get it, you know? So um, yep. yeah, sorry. I just lost you here. There we go. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I got you here. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, man. I, you know, that's that's. I think it's just a small part of a, a pretty big problem that's that's happening right now. It's just farmers, but um, the shrinking of public access. But I think I think it's it's happening pretty good. I mean, I think I think the states are doing well with opening up more walking access and and more public land. So, and it's good that we have more hunters in general, anyway, man. So, yeah, um, yeah, it is, and uh, I think. I think over time, as long as we sort of all have some some sort of continuity or collective mindset towards the future of hunting, we'll be all right. It's just, you know, you, it, it comes back to all thinking about the long term goal. It's like, what do we want at the end of our lives? Do we we want there to be enough animals to hunt and we want there to be enough people to hunt them so that you yep. can continue that North American model of conservation? Yeah. And how we get, everybody's got different ideas on how we get there. But if you're not thinking of about those two things, then that's just selfish, you know? So at the, at the end of the day, I, I feel like if everybody, if everybody stays focused on that, um, we'll be all right. We've yeah. got, we've got enough, you know, good people in the ranks that are willing to take kids out and that are w willing to increase the habitat quality for these things that, or we'll be we'll be fine we're just always going to be fighting challenges of some sort that's just part of life with, with anything though yeah now 100 percent. and then you know and then there's the anti-hunting challenges that we oh yeah we face also which i think we've done a pretty good job lately i don't there's a new company or a new organization called howl for wildlife um, oh yeah it's been I doing a good job guys. you know those guys yeah, yeah. Uh, what's your opinions on some of that stuff man what do you guys got going through that um yeah, we try to help the Howl guys out anytime we can. Um, I'm in touch with them probably every week on because they know what's going on politically and with these bills and stuff that are coming across the table. They they have their ear to the ground on that nonstop, whereas I, I don't. So I like to be and, and anybody can, you know, be a member and get their email updates and stuff so that they know what's coming down the pipe. But that's that's a great organization. There's several other ones like it out there that are constantly going to bat for hunters and for wildlife. And, uh, I think as long as we, it, for the most part, like you said, we, we go about this the right way as hunters, not all the time, but for the most part, we're pretty mature about it. We understand the gripe on the other side of the aisle. 
and we try to have legitimate civil conversations about it, which is really all you can do. Um, where you know, the problems is when you get super emotional and you start throwing stones at people without even attempting to understand their perspective. And then you just, you're, you know, you hit a wall yeah. or you put up a wall in between the two of you where there's, where there's no conversation that's even being had. But I, I agree. It is a, it is a central topic that we're always focused on, especially in a YouTube space, because we get lots of anti hunters that see our videos. Lots <laughs> yeah. of them. And they are not, some of them are really, really mad and upset, but yeah. once you get to talking to them, it's in almost every situation, it's pretty clear that they don't fully understand our perspective. And I'll admit, I don't fully understand theirs, but I think that's why it's important to have that line of communication open between the two so yeah. that they can see. On the flip side of that coin, we've also had some anti-hunters comment and email us and said, hey, I did not approve of hunting until I watched a few of your videos. And hunting the way you guys do it is actually not at all what I thought it, it was like. It's like, well, that's not just how we do it. That's how most people do it. Yeah. Like, that's how most of your your hunting public, your general public that hunts, behaves in this way. Like mm -hmm. we kill animals legally, we harvest them and we eat them, we consume them, and our money goes back into conservation for those animals. Said so we're not bloodthirsty killers that are out there to try to decimate the populations. In fact, we want the complete opposite of that. We want to hunt something so that we can have more of them down range or even stable populations of them so that they don't get diseased and die off so that they're healthy yeah. um that's that's and when you start explaining that to them a lot of times the light bulbs go off and you can see it and that's really cool because yeah. then then you open that line of communication and and you you might not turn them into hunters but just as important they might understand you better to the point where they are not advocating against hunting in their area. Yes. Yes. That's yeah. Well said, man. And I think the key ingredient there is if we have people that are open-minded enough to listen to the other person. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I definitely have, and I've had some great conversations with people that did not understand hunting. They had a different perspective on hunting. It's usually the perspective is, is just someone out there trying to murder animals, right? <laughs> There's plus yeah. a lot of trying to murder animals. And I, and I had to, and after good conversations and they were open and they asked me, you know, Hey, tell me about this. I want to understand more. And after I tell them about the conservation part of it, how like a hunter, most hunters, there's a bad apples in every group, but most hunters understand and have more knowledge about that animal and care about that animal more than most people do. And that we're consuming the animal after we harvest the animal, after they understand all that. And, and even like that, when we kill an animal, hopefully it's a good quick death. That's probably the best best death that animal's going to have rather than starvation or freezing to death or getting eaten alive by predators. After good conversations like that, they like you said, they may understand it more. May not still may not be a hunter in the future, but now at least they may not be on the opposite side fighting against hunting. Yep. And there's a bunch of issues we face still. I mean, those guys are always sending me stuff to talk about in our podcast especially with this latest deal on the Pittman Robertson uh, act where, you know, that would, that would really curtail all of that work and all that money that has gone through Pittman Robertson over the years, that would be catastrophic to that. And that's, as you know, is very, very important for hunters and wildlife all over the country. Mm -hmm. But, and it's also interesting, um, it's an interesting dynamic because I would say the majority of hunters are conservatives. They're probably Republicans, if you will, or they lean to that side. However, these issues are not, these issues have very little distinction to a political party. Like they, they come from Democrats. They come from Republicans. These bills that get sprouted up, that don't make any sense to us as hunters. And I feel like that's a, that's a, something that we always have to be mindful of is if you are in a political box on whatever side of the aisle that you subscribe to, some of these bills may challenge that box, <laughs> yeah. especially when it comes to wildlife and public access and um, hunting in general. 
Mm-hmm. You know, there's a there's a lot of that going on, and that's one of the issues with the Pittman Robertson Act right now. Um, yeah. That I've and I don't know near as much about it as the Howell guys do. So go over there and learn more about it, definitely from them, because they can speak intelligently on it. I just have the main bullets, you know. But Aaron, that's if you would, always got to be mindful of. Give our give the listeners just a some a ten thousand foot view on on that act right now, so they have a little bit of understanding before they head over to to Howell. Well, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of uh, politicians that have brought that forward. And as you'll see, a lot of them are right wing conservatives that are for the bill. And they actually believe that by removing the provisions of Pittman Robertson, it's going to increase your Second Amendment rights in some way, shape or form. It's going to decrease the amount of taxes that you're going to have to pay on guns. Um, which, as you know, if you're if you're a conservative uh, to the core, you want less taxes, less government, less regulations and everything. But this particular regulation puts a hell of a lot of money back into the pot for wildlife and for hunters. Right. And if we just get rid of that and don't, you know, that money, that feed stops, then a lot of a lot of the things that benefit from Pittman Robertson are also going to suffer. So. It's it's not I understand that line of thinking, I guess. I mean, I under I, I totally would rather pay less taxes, 100 percent as an individual and as a business owner. That'd be great. <laughs> um, but I, I do. There is um, that some of these taxes, like in this particular case, go to things that are instrumental in hunting as we know it. So you have you have to kind of that's kind of the whole thing, because obviously I'm a I'm a Second Amendment supporter. And I want less taxes, but at the end of the day, at what cost? Right. You know, I don't want, I don't want this to hurt wildlife conservation or, or hunting access or hunters anywhere. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's why these issues are becoming increasingly complex all the time. Some of them are a lot easier. They're cut and dry. It's, you know, it's a bunch of uh, anti hunters from the city who have lived in concrete most of their life and don't really understand hunting bringing a bill to save the bears or whatever yeah you know where you yeah um and then you, you've got the you've got the other side that are hunters that are trying to promote bear hunting and conservation and th- those sides are very they're very black and white there still needs to be discussion between the two groups in, in fact there needs to be more discussion between those two groups in all senses that way they understand each other's perspectives um, yes but but that's a different that's a separate issue from the one that we're talking about where yeah. is I've, that's what I've seen is you actually this issue is drumming up uh, disagreements uh, from hunters on both sides. Like there's a hunter over here that, that thinks that that is in favor of this act and there's a hunter over here that's not, um, which is a, which is very interesting to say the least, but. That's just the, t- I guess that's just my view of it. I could have got some things wrong. So go to Howl and check to yeah. get the rest of the scoop. But yeah, definitely yeah. scary stuff out there going on. And I think it's, it's in very important for all of us to stay up to date on, on those sorts of current events. Yeah. And all you guys listening, that's um, I'll put a link here in the description, Howl for wildlife and, and I'll link that straight to that issue. Um, but you know, that's interesting uh, of that point right there, because one thing that I have seen with a group like Hal and other groups out there and with these anti-hunting groups, it is actually, I feel like the hunting industry, us as hunters have been divided for a while, gun guys versus bow guys or trad guys versus compound guys, or like, you know, we've been divided and kind of bickered against each other for a long time. And with a bigger issue like, um, you know, save the bears or like introducing wolves into Colorado. I'm going to use that as an example because that's still a sore subject for me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it has actually brought hunters together as a whole. And we now are together um, facing one one issue rather than fighting against ourselves. So I like that. But like you just brought that point up is some hunters are on both sides of the fence on this new bill. So, yeah, Aaron, uh, shoot, that's- man. You know what? What we'll we'll get off the political stuff just for a second, and let's talk about <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about what you guys got in store for this season, man. What's the future hell of the hold for the hunting public? 
<laughs> uh, we're going to try to go to fewer places this this fall than we did last year. We kind of got overextended last year, bought too many tags, and we're just doing too much running around. So we're going to try to hunt around home more this year and uh, just get, like, each of us may have one other out-of-state tag until we fill it. And if we're able to fill it and get some meat in the freezer, then we will go to another over-the-counter state somewhere. But like last year, going into the fall, each of us had like four or five different tags. Mm -hmm. So we would hunt somewhere for like five days and we'd be like, oh, you know, we've got to be here. So Jake can hunt here. So Aaron can hunt here for this deal or whatever. And about the time we'd leave, it would be about the time we were starting to figure things out. Yeah. So it was just, it was a grind because the first, you know, the first half of all these hunts is usually work. It's like figuring out your camp logistically, understanding how the roads lay, you know, figuring out where you can get internet access, getting your, uh, starting to understand how the heck the wildlife are using that landscape. Like where are the deer going? Where, where are the deer bedded? Where are the hunters at? That takes days mm -hmm. before you're finally starting to dial in on what's going on. And, you know, a lot of times we have success on these hunts on day six, seven, and eight, because that's when we've been there long enough to sort of figure things out. Mm -hmm. But if you have to leave on day five or the beginning of day six, it's right when you're figuring things out, then you're just starting that whole sort of grinding process over again. So we're not, we're getting away from that this fall. We're going to hunt way more at home. I'm planning on getting more doe tags for sure here in yep. the Midwest yep. um, and spending more time here than we have in the past, but we're still going to travel up. I think we're going out West hunting antelope and deer and elk for most of the month of september and okay. ted also has a kansas tag all right great well then that makes a lot of sense man because uh it, you're right it not only filming and needing internet but just to hunt alone you need to under so if you've never been in that spot it takes multiple days to start to figure out that spot so that new game plan makes a lot of sense for me man i'm sure you guys will find a lot more success and where are you guys headed out west man what state um Ted's going to Kansas hunting whitetail. Zach's going to be hunting elk in Colorado. Uh, and then antelope in Montana. And I'll be hunting whitetails in Wyoming. All right. I'm about to head so, out to uh, uh, Wyoming here in about a week to go hunt antelope with my bow. So, Oh, sweet. Uh, that would yeah. be awesome. Yeah, I'm excited about that hunt. Heck but, yeah. Uh, I really want to get out there and chase them. I haven't had the opportunity to yet because I'm always – I'm elk hunting is my favorite thing to do. And mm -hmm. so if I get an opportunity to go once every two or three years, I'm always, you know, putting all my chips in that basket and then deer come second after that. But yeah. antelope come somewhere in third or fourth place. And I just haven't had time. I like, I've got to give up deer or elk to be able to go hunt them in some capacity. Yeah. So I haven't been able to do that yet, but I'm probably going to one of these days. It just looks like too much fun. <laughs> it's definitely a challenging hunt and you could probably squeeze that out early in the season like uh in august before deer really get ramped up you know um but yeah definitely a good challenging hunt i watched your guys's um hunt with born and raised your hunt your elk hunt man that was that was awesome a lot of days in the on the mountain man you guys spent, spent a ton of time there so uh, i'll look forward to watching the next elk hunt that you go on to for sure Thanks, man. Yeah, we should have some really cool elk content coming on the channel here in the next month because uh, Zach and Jake and uh, Roy and our other buddies um, were out in Colorado last year and had a great hunt. Um, okay. There'll be four or five videos coming down the pipe that we'll probably post in early September from last year's elk hunt. But that Wyoming hunt was a grind. That was a that was that was the best time of my life, I would probably say. Yeah, that seemed like it, man. I mean, the video was was pretty amazing. So, and yeah. uh, for all you guys listening, I know you probably know who the hunting public uh, guys are. If you don't, Aaron, obviously you have the uh, YouTube channel, uh, the hunting public. Is there any other spots that they can find all your content? Uh, the hunting public.com. Follow us on most social media platforms. And we also have some stuff on Amazon. All right. Very nice, man. Well, I won't take up any more of your time, Aaron. Thanks so much for being on my podcast. And uh, I hope we get to do a couple more down, down the road. Yeah, man. We'd love to. My pleasure. Yeah. All right, guys. This is the Western Obsessions TV podcast. 
I'm your host, Kurt Belding, and, and you just listened to, to Mr. Aaron here with the hunting public. Thanks for listening. This is the Western Obsessions TV podcast, where hunting's not a hobby, it's an obsession. <laughs>